Before we get into today's episode, I want to point out, obviously, that tomorrow is going to be Black Friday. Today is Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving, y'all. And I just want to let you know that Knox Investa is actually going to be able to participate in Black Friday, Small Business Saturday, and Cyber Monday with some really cool sales. If you've already checked out the website and you're looking for the right moment to buy, tomorrow and this whole weekend is going to be that right time. We're launching a new product and we're gonna have some amazing discounts. So make sure to check it out at noxvesta.com, N-O-X-V-E-S-T-A.com. This time of year, many families in the United States gather for a Thanksgiving feast to celebrate the colonization of America. However, most people don't know about the darker side of Jamestown and the grim feasts that are said to have occurred there. But Blair, I hear you cry. I have excellent hearing, don't deny it. What on earth could the terrible incidents of 1609 to 1610 in colonial Virginia have to do with the famously saccharine joint celebration between Native Americans and religious lunatics in Proto-Massachusetts in 1621? Well, your instantaneous grasp of American historical minutiae is impressive, but you're jumping ahead quite a bit. Settle down while I set up the background for this tale, and it is quite the tale. Today, we're talking about the starving time and the unsettling ways a group of unprepared, unequipped colonists filled their bellies when the food stores and their generosity of the Powhatan tribe ran out. Fair warning, this episode is about cannibalism. If that isn't your thing, make sure to check out my puppy's channel, Casper the Friendly Floof, to uh, you know have something more lighthearted today. What version of the Thanksgiving legend do you remember most vividly? Do you think of the colonists in their cute little pilgrim costumes and gold buckled hats? Maybe you think of the hungry Protestants breaking bread with Native Americans clothed in deer skin, their heads crowned with colorful feathered headdresses. Or perhaps you remember the story of John Smith, the grown ass man who marketed his relationship with an 11 year old princess as a love story. It wasn't, and we'll address that European fantasy of a white culture worshiping Native American later. Pocahontas was actually a strong, intelligent, and brave young woman who served as a translator, ambassador, and leader. Anyway, we're about to wreck whatever remains of the Thanksgiving mythology your elementary teachers may have drilled into your head, so buckle up your hats, baby, because things are about to get gross. It all started in April, 1607, when three ships carrying 104 colonists made landfall in Virginia on marshy land that the native Powhatan tribe didn't even consider worth occupying because it wasn't suitable for agriculture. These entirely unprepared colonists showed up just in time for a seven year drought, the driest period in 770 years. Not only were these colonists totally clueless about the continent they were attempting to conquer, but most of them were also traditional English gentlemen who showed no inclination or ability to hunt, fish, or farm. Instead, they relied on overseas shipments and later straight up theft from the Native Americans. Relations with the local native tribes were strained from the get-go. A band of Native Americans attacked the settlers' ships upon arrival, and not long after the colonists began building their settlement, a band of 200 Native Americans attacked them, killing at least one settler and wounding 11 others. Fearing for their lives, the settlers quickly built James Fort, completing construction just two months after arriving. Despite their new fortifications, things continued to get worse for the English settlers from there on out. Between May and September of 1607, 50 of the 104 colonists died, mostly from disease. This is the sort of thing that happens when you decide to cross an ocean and introduce a group of underfed rich people to the blood-sucking mosquitoes that live in the marshlands of Virginia, particularly when your collective knowledge of medicine is somewhere between drink wine and hope it gets better, and surely a series of razor blade cuts will help this cough. Their immune systems were roughly as effective as six layers of tissue paper, and the blood-sucking parasites, mosquitoes, not colonists, made sure that everyone got a little taste of whatever was going around. 20 of the citizens perished in August alone. In December, while looking for food with two other men, Captain John Smith, the infamous bullshit artist, was captured by none other than Opechancano, the brother of Wahansenkau, the chief of the Powhatan tribe. After killing the rest of Smith's crew, the chief's brother brought him to Powhatan capital, located about 12 miles from Jamestown. This is when Smith's highly fictionalized account of his attempted execution took place. He claimed Princess Pocahontas, inspired by his innocence, threw herself between him and his would-be killers. Smith, who seemingly enjoyed writing narcissistic fan fiction about himself, wrote several different versions of this meeting over the course of his life. He was the only person to tell this story, and every time he did so, it changed ever so slightly. 
Smith didn't even start telling the story until 1624, when there were no witnesses alive to refute it. If it did happen at all, it almost certainly didn't happen the way Smith says it did. In one of his accounts of the event, Smith claimed that after Pocahontas saved his life, the Powhatan threw a feast in his honor. In his book, A Land As God Made It, John Horn states that, quote, Pocahontas would not have acted on her own initiative to save the Englishman. As far as we know, she never met Smith before the ceremony. Since she was just 11 years old, such a public display of disobedience to her father in the presence of his great men would have been unthinkable. Historians today believe that if the dramatic scene played out at all like Smith described it, it was most likely a ceremony establishing peace between the disparate groups with Smith captured and sentenced to death and then ritually spared to show goodwill, followed by a feast with the chief's daughter as his side as a symbolic welcome to the family. Tribal politics of the time were full of these sorts of rituals, exchanges of gifts, trading of representatives, token shows of strength and mercy by those in power frequently misunderstood and misinterpreted by European colonists, who always seemed to start with the assumption that the Native Americans were Stone Age savages with no capacity for abstract thought. By the end of the first year, there were only 38 English settlers still alive in Jamestown, but it's cool because Captain Christopher Newport, who had sailed for England that June, returned in January 1608 with 100 new colonists and more supplies. Smith was actually sentenced to hang for the deaths of the two companions who were with him when he was captured, but Newport decided to spare him and leave him in charge. The two men then traveled to visit the chief to give him some gifts and trade hostages. I mean, wards. Wards are a tradition that has variants all over the world, from the Native American tribes to feudal Japan, and even among royal families in Europe, perhaps explaining why the Jamestown settlers were able to wrap their heads around the concept and not take it literally. Game of Thrones fan, remember, Theron Greyjoy living with the Starks? Yeah, old GRR didn't make up that sort of thing out of his own fuzzy bearded head. Generally speaking, two people in power would trade family members, usually younger sons or nephews. Whereas a political marriage involves one family marrying into the other via a daughter, words were often a bit more equable, a sort of deliberate vulnerability. You have one of my children, I have one of your children. If either of us makes a wrong move, you could see how this would make people a little more polite towards each other. Sometimes these exchanges were a bit more one-sided. A central ruler of a divided or fractious kingdom might have all of his subordinates send their sons to his court for training, but he definitely wouldn't send them wards in return. Either way, the practice of exchanging wards had an additional benefit. When the traded children returned home, they brought with them detailed knowledge of the other group's customs, beliefs, languages, and cultures, thus enhancing mutual understanding between everyone. Huzzah for implicit threats of violence and infanticide leading to peaceful coexistence. With regards to the colony in Virginia, Smith and Newport left a young English boy named Thomas Savage, and one has to assume these knobheads thought that was a hilarious coincidence to learn the language and customs. The Powhatan sent a young native man named Namontak to do the same. Namontak ended up leaving for England with Captain Newport and Captain Archer in April of 1608. They returned to Jamestown in September with 70 new colonists and the first two women, one of whom is never mentioned again and is believed to have died soon after her arrival. King James, being completely uninformed and totally out of touch, instructed Newport to present to the chief of the Powhatan people a ceremonial crown meant to symbolize subordination to the English king. But Wahan Sen Kao, who already the king of over 30 tribes that comprised nearly 15,000 people, refused to kneel. See, he wasn't just any chief. He was the most powerful chief on the Atlantic seaboard with a kingdom that covered 10,000 square miles. This caused strained relations between the Powhatan and the English. That month, despite his history of fatal errors, Smith was elected president of the Jamestown Council. And this is where things got ugly. In December, facing a harsh winter and running out of food, the colonists attempted to trade with local native settlements, but the tribes refused to deal with them as the chief had instructed them not to. Captain Newport again dipped out and returned to England to pick up the second supply, more settlers and goods for the colony. In January, Smith met with the Powhatan tribe at their capital and immediately violated an important Native American custom by refusing to disarm in the presence of the chief. The chief at this point grew tired of Smith's bullshit and decided to kill him in the night. According to Smith and his crew, Pocahontas warned Smith of the danger, saving his life a second time. Whatever the truth is behind his escape, the incident kicked off months of raids and ambushes between the colonizers and the native tribes. 
The third supply, a nine ship fleet carrying between five and 6,000 colonist passengers, a bunch of livestock and a year's worth of provisions left England for Jamestown in June of 1609, but was scattered by a hurricane in July. One ship sank during a storm. The ship carrying Captain Newport somehow managed to reach Bermuda with all 150 passengers, but the ship was damaged. The few boats that survived didn't arrive in Jamestown until August, and by then few provisions remained and only about 300 passengers were still alive. Back in Jamestown, the colonists were raising all kinds of hell using the terror tactics they once used on their Irish neighbors back in Europe against the native tribes. Deception, ambush, surprise, random slaughter, calculated murder, and the outright destruction of entire villages. The tribes could be just as violent, but they preferred to take prisoners, often sparing the lives of women, children, and chiefs. So this kind of total warfare was new to them. These skirmishes put both the Powhatan and the colonists on edge. About 60 of the colonists attempted to buy an island from the Nassimon tribe, who considered it sacred. Somehow negotiations resulted in the wounding of the chief's son, the killing of two English messengers, and the town and crops being burned to the ground. Colonists also desecrated the tombs of their kings for good measure because apparently that was a good idea in their minds. In the winter of 1609, Smith made his final bonehead move as president of the Jamestown Council when he sent men to buy the fortified town of Powhatan from the chief's older brother, Parahunt. Again, negotiations went so poorly that it led to a bloody confrontation and resulted in the deaths of 60 Englishmen, kicking off the first Anglo-Powhatan War. Smith didn't hang around for the fallout from that disaster. He hopped on a boat back to England after suffering a mysterious gunpowder explosion. And before we continue onward to discuss for a moment John Smith's um, Johnson, we're gonna just pause for a moment and thank today's sponsors. The holidays can be hectic, but HelloFresh helps keep things simple with recipes and ingredients that cut out grocery shopping and limit meal prep so you can spend more of the festive season with friends and family. Ingredients travel from the farm straight to your door within a week, so you can get the convenience without skimping on the quality. I know I've said this many times before, but I really love using the HelloFresh app and how easy it is to customize my meals. They have over like 50 meals and different food items you can choose from every single week, and I can choose a five I want this or that this week. If I wanna skip a week, it lets me do everything right there. And it also lets me plan up to, I think like six weeks in advance. It's something crazy. So I can meal prep very far, have it nicely planned out in my calendar. And I know exactly what I'm eating every single day of the week. So if you wanna get started with HelloFresh, make sure you go to hellofresh.com slash prism14 and use code prism14 for up to 14 free meals and three free gifts. Again, that's hellofresh.com slash prism14 and use code prism14 for up to 14 free meals and three free gifts. And hey, maybe you do want that home-cooked meal tonight, but maybe it's just too much effort. There was just too much stress going on in the day, whatever, and you just need something now. With DoorDash, you don't need to travel to experience something new. DoorDash has over 300,000 partners, so you can support your neighborhood go-tos or choose from your favorite national chains like Popeye's, Chipotle, and Cheesecake Factory. Ordering is easy, and your items will be left safely outside your door when you choose contactless delivery drop-off. For a limited time, our listeners can get 25% off and zero delivery fees on their first order of $15 or more when you download the DoorDash app and enter code PRISM. That's 25% off up to a $10 value and zero delivery fees on your first order when you download the DoorDash app in the App Store and enter code PRISM. Don't forget that's code PRISM for 25% off your first order with DoorDash. Subject to change, terms apply. Now, this is one story that notorious self-promoter John Smith didn't like to tell. It's important to know that back in the 1600s and 1700s, soldiers carried their gunpowder in leather pouches attached to their belts. Apparently, while returning to the colony from an expedition upriver, Smith fell asleep in his boat. Now, according to Smith, while he was sleeping, his powder bag somehow ignited, burning nine or 10 square inches where his torso met his thighs. Simply to say, he was burned right in the crotch. He jumped into the river to extinguish the fire, nearly drowning before his companions fished him out. Smith barely survived this injury. He made it back to Jamestown, where after some inexplicable delays, he was loaded onto a boat to England. George Percy took over as president of the colony upon Smith's departure. Percy was one of the original colonists, having arrived with Smith, Captain Archer, and the others. 
He was from a lesser noble house in England, notable because his father and uncle were both implicated in the gunpowder plot, the Catholic conspiracy to blow up the parliament with a barrel of gunpowder on November the 5th of 1605. This incident is the source of the tradition from Guy Fawkes Day, the rhyme about remember, remember the 5th of November and eventually Alan Moore. Next time you see someone posting with that anonymous mustache mask thing from V for Vendetta, now you can also think about the uncle of this dude who just really fucking hated John Smith. Percy thought John was, to quote his own words from the time, an ambitious, unworthy, and vainglorious fellow attempting to take all men's authorities from them. Percy may have been a little bit cranky because he had not been elected to the council when the colonists first arrived, whereas Smith liked to lord his position of power over everyone. Percy would later publish his own account of the early years of Jamestown for the explicit purpose of countering Smith's version of events, which of course painted Smith as some sort of God among men who single-handedly saved the entire colony. But back to Smith and his exploding package, how did that unfortunately located gunpowder ignite? It's quite possible that it was purely an accident. Gunpowder at the time was notoriously uneven and unpredictable in its quality and power. And it was common for armed men to also keep a low burning match or tinderbox handy near their powder bags to readily light the fuses of their ballistic contraptions. Honestly, guns in general at this time period were frequently far more dangerous to their wielders than to anyone on the other end of them. However, some historians theorize, code for wildly speculate, that this accident may have actually been an assassination attempt. Smith himself named three men who wanted to kill him, writing that they quote, plotted to have him murdered in his bed. And you heard that right. Smith was the kind of guy who liked to refer to himself in the third person. Now, none of the three people Smith accused of wanting him dead were on the boat with him at the time of the accident. And neither was Percy who, as noted, couldn't stand Smith and would have been plausibly motivated to kill him. But the men didn't have to be in a boat though. They easily could have tasked someone else with the job. Smith himself was convinced that at least two specific members of Jamestown leadership, John Ratcliffe and Gabriel Archer wanted him dead and that if they weren't behind the plot to explode gunpowder in his lap, then they were at least trying to kill him afterwards. On the other hand, Smith, as noted by many of his contemporaries, was a narcissistic asshole who treated anyone who didn't fall down and worship him as a mortal enemy. And he spent plenty of time imagining opposition and plots against him as a sort of strange hobby. It isn't as though random death was uncommon or inexplicable in Jamestown at this time. If someone had wanted Smith dead, putting a musket ball in his skull on a deserted forest path would have been easier or hunting him down with a bow and arrow to shift blame to the Native Americans. Then again, igniting a bag of gunpowder next to someone's genitals could be a particularly cruel form of revenge. As fun as these speculations are, most historians, the boring ones, believe that it's most likely that Smith caused the explosion himself through carelessness or bad luck, and he simply preferred to believe in a world where all the bad things that were happening to him were plots and conspiracies. And while nobody knows the full extent of Smith's injuries, it is known that he never married. So some implications can be made. The next month, the chief invited the English to visit his new capital at Orapax, a bit far away from Jamestown. When the colonizers arrived, they were ambushed. Powhatan warriors killed over 30 of their men. Powhatan women captured their leader, Captain John Ratcliffe, and skinned him alive with mussel shells. Only a quarter of the colonists survived. The Powhatan people were tired of the English strong arming them for help, attacking their people and stealing their food. So the chief ordered a siege on Jamestown. Powhatan warriors trapped the colonists in their fort and cut off their access to the woods. They killed any colonists or livestock they caught outside the walls of the fort. This began what is historically known as the starving time. The Powhatan people then waited for starvation and disease to dissolve their Englishman problem. It wasn't long before weakened colonists started dying of dysentery and typhoid. Trapped, they fed on whatever they could find, including snakes, rats, cats, dogs, horses, and the leather of their shoes. Things were so bad in the fort that a man named Hugh Prize was reported to lose all hope, shouting that if God really existed, he wouldn't allow them to starve. According to George Percy, the president of the Jamestown council during the starving time, Pierce and a quote, corpulent butcher fled Jamestown later that afternoon. They were immediately killed by Powhatan warriors. Soon there were charges of cannibalism in the colony. George Percy, the president of the Jamestown council at the time wrote, quote, nothing was spared to maintain life and to do those things which seemed incredible as to dig up dead corpses out of the graves and to eat them. He wrote that other colonists, quote, licked up the blood which had fallen from their weak fellows. One man is said to have killed his pregnant wife and chopped her into pieces before salting and eating her. He was discovered halfway through his meal. 
According to Percy, the colonists tortured the man until he confessed, then they burned him alive. For a long time, historians argued that none of the reports of cannibalism were entirely credible. They argued that Percy might've exaggerated so people wouldn't blame him for the severity of the famine. However, no records speak of the 14-year-old English girl who researchers refer to as Jane, whose remains, uncovered by archeologists in 2012, lend credibility to historical accounts of post-mortem cannibalism. Jane's bones, along with other grisly evidence of the starving time, the bones of dogs, horses, and at least one other human were found in a trash pit at Jamestown. The cut marks on Jane's skull show that her flesh and brain were removed. There are tentative cuts to the forehead, likely made from a hesitant hand, then four strikes to the back of the head. In a briefing with the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History, archeologist Doug Owsley said, the skull was split in half, most likely with a lightweight ax or quite possibly a cleaver. A puncture on the left side of Jane's head was used to leave her open her skull and remove her brain. We don't know much about Jane because like most women, she wasn't recorded in historical documents. Nobody knows how she died, but it is believed from nitrogen and isotopes in her bones that indicate she had a high protein diet and grew up in the South coastal regions of England, that she was either the daughter of a gentleman or a noblewoman's maidservant. Historians think she arrived on one of the ships from the fleet that the hurricane scattered in July of 1609. Forensic evidence suggests that Jane was butchered shortly after she died. It would have had to be done quickly, Dr. Owsley says, because quote, brains do not preserve well. According to Bill Kelso, the chief archeologist of the Jamestown Rediscover Project, quote, we feel the nature of the first cuts on the skull, which were close together, were done to someone who was either unconscious or already dead. Hundreds of cut marks from knives, saws, and cleavers were found on Jane's bones. In addition to the marks of butchery crisscrossing Jane's skull, we also saw marks along her jaw and cuts all over her facial bones. Evidence that her cheeks, tongue, and leg muscles were also removed. According to Owsley, quote, this evidence is absolutely consistent with dismemberment and defleshing of this body. The same flesh taken from animals was considered a delicacy at that time. Chop marks on Jane's shin bone resemble the butcher's mark seen on animal bones, but the rest of the marks don't appear to be made by someone as capable, indicating that more than one person may have participated in her post-mortem dismemberment. Owsley theorizes Jane may have been chosen because she had no living family members to protest her consumption. He also thinks it's possible that Jane's inexperienced butchers could have been women as they made up the majority of Jamestown's inhabitants. Archeologists and scientists are almost certain Jane was not the only victim. The discovery of her body, however, is actually extremely notable because it is the very first piece of artifactual evidence of cannibalism by Europeans at any European colony. Forensic scientists scanned Jane's fragmented skull and made a three-dimensional replica of her reconstructed face, which we've linked in our notes. Only 60 of the 240 remaining colonists survived into the spring of 1610. Among the dead was an important member of Jamestown leadership, Captain Gabriel Archer. In the early days of the colony, Archer had taken part in a major inland expedition to explore the Chesapeake Bay area and to parlay with the Powhatan and other local tribes. He held a leadership position in Jamestown since the construction of the James Fort in 1607 and was a vocal critic of the many missteps of John Smith, even going so far as calling for Smith's execution when his dealings with the Powhatan got two of the men who came with him killed. Archer's interment in the chapel is a testament to the colonists' high regard for him. Not only was he given a proper burial during a time when food was scarce and people were desperate, he was buried with a ceremonial leading staff and a small silver reliquary containing a lead ampulla, which is usually used for carrying holy water, oil, or blood. This ampulla contained a viscous fluid and it also held several bone fragments that are thought to be human. Archer's death left the surviving settlers essentially leaderless. When an English ship finally arrived at Jamestown in May of 1610, they found the colony on the brink of collapse. To make matters worse, the ship was supposed to be bringing supplies to the colonists, but a hurricane had blown it off course and wrecked it. The crew consumed most of the supplies while they repaired the ship. They arrived at Jamestown with hardly any food for the starving settlers and finding the town in chaos, decided to abandon it and sail to Newfoundland. Just as they were about to set sail, another ship arrived in the Jamestown port and this one with the desperately needed supplies. The colony was saved, but the Powhatan were doomed. Onboard the ship was Jamestown's new governor, Thomas West, third Baron Delaware, who side note is the origin of the name Delaware. 
de la War placed Percy as the head of the town council and accused the surviving Jamestown residents of laziness, saying they only had themselves to blame for the starving time. He imposed stricter rules for life in the colony, bordering on the fascist. His rules were so strict that even people in the 1600s were taken aback by them. De La War handed out harsh punishments for sloth and theft. For example, he had an alleged food thief tied to a tree until he starved to death. Having established himself as a complete monster dictator, De La War then set out to destroy the surrounding Native American tribes using the scorched earth tactic. He ordered raiding parties to burn native villages, crops, and provisions, stealing what they could and destroying the rest. Historians consider this military style campaign to be the first full war between England and the Native Americans. The Native Americans kept the colonists surrounded and off balance for years, but with the influx of men and guns and De La War's tactics of extreme brutality, the long simmering conflict turned sharply against the tribes. Mind you, most of the other colonists were on board with this program of horrifying slaughter. One would argue that few who had survived the starving time might at least understand the motives given what they had witnessed and probably done but a great deal of the fervor was just standard issue xenophobia and religious extremism. De La War announced that he would take all the Native American children and forcibly indoctrinate them into Christianity. Percy himself, now subordinate to De La War, wrote later of an incident in which a group of Paspaheg warriors attacked the blockhouse that guarded the entrance to the peninsula where Jamestown was situated. In the counterattack, Percy, along with two others, led a team of soldiers by boat to launch an assault of the village, killing 15 or 16 people and burning the buildings. Percy attempted to capture and spare the queen and the tribe's children, but wrote that his men were angry and restless that he had not killed them like the men and other women. So waffling under pressure, he gave in. The men threw the children over the side of the boat and quote, shot their brains in the water. News of this and other massacres spread up and down the coast among the Native American communities, resulting in a complete breakdown in relations between local tribes and the colonizing Europeans. However, they also had learned about the power of European cannons and ships. So when the pilgrims landed at Plymouth Rock, the Wampanoag were wary of new arrivals, but also interested in convincing them to take out some rival tribes with their guns. They attempted to placate the colonists with gifts and offered their agricultural wisdom, which the colonists, of course, accepted as their just and rightful due. When the first harvest rolled around, the Wampanoag were still nervously monitoring the colony. The pilgrims, using the knowledge and resources gained from them, had a successful growing season. They decided to throw themselves a feast to celebrate, during which they got riotlessly drunk and started firing their guns in the air. Because apparently, the uniquely American fixation with firearms goes back all the way. Hearing the gunfire, the Wampanoag panicked and sent the equivalent of a special forces unit to the Plymouth colony, assuming that the moment they'd feared had arrived and the colonists were about to go berserk and murder them. Imagine their relief when it turned out to be just a bunch of drunk assholes blowing off some steam. They retreated, returning later with some nice fresh venison, thus beginning the first extremely awkward and tense Thanksgiving conversation between people who honestly kind of hate each other, a tradition that is held present to this day. And that's the initial tale of Jamestown. Admittedly, not a direct route to Thanksgiving, but certainly something to think about as you prep your stuffing and consider potential turkey alternatives. I can't recommend eating your fellow colonists myself, but you know, needs must be taken care of when the devil drives. Enjoy your time with your families, friends, coworkers, pets, whatever you're doing today. And if you can, take heart about how much worse it could be, even though sometimes it feels like we're already there. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to like, subscribe, comment, ring the bell, and join our Patreon. Feel free to check out more of my episodes where I explore similar content. My puppy Casper also has a channel where you can find his videos and just see him being a cute little fuzzy goober. You can also check out my newest project, Thinkology, and subscribe to the podcast, which is linked below, and you can find great content on the go. Hopefully you all enjoyed this episode and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.